right now it's uh, 8 33 so um james? the floor is, is your mr james oh, well, it, thank you terry no just to, just to open so i guess everybody um got their microphone on mute unless they want to speak well could look you know Welcome to your first Zoom or Team or Google meet, meet, meeting of the day, which no doubt will all be followed by many more. Um, like Jimmy, we, we all put ties on because we thought that, you know, that, that uh, Catherine might have organized coffee and croissant ver virtually like, uh, like uh, the chamber used to do in, in, the, in the BC, BC times. Um, this morning is a discussion about PVC, PwC's interesting work on, uh, on the financial services and what's in play currently between, uh, between uh, France and, and the UK. And uh, Jimmy Zhu, who's partner of financial services and real estate for PwC, and his team are going to uh, take us all through his, uh, their findings. So Jimmy may be... Uh, I hand over to you, and then, and then we'll come back. We have uh, very fortunate Sylvie Goulart, who is uh, deputy governor of the Bank of England, unless a uh, Bank of uh, France, sorry, not Bank of England yet. Maybe that's in the future. Um, and uh, and Miles Selik, who's chief executive officer of the of the City UK, to discuss uh, where they see things going forward, and of course. Uh, our audience, our participants, who uh, who can um, who who of course be more than welcome to our, ask questions, uh, perhaps a little later on. So, uh, Jimmy, I hand over to you. Yeah, thank you, thank you, James. Uh, I, I will do my very quick introduction just to just introduce this new uh, this new report on uh, on financial services. So, it, it is for us um, a great achievement with uh, we, 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 we with course uh, Channel Institute. So, along with my Franco-British Chamber and DIT uh, uh, colleagues. So, so um, for me, uh, this report is uh, is, um, is important for two two main reasons. Why? Because uh, one because um, it's about financial services, you know. So we heard much about uh, fishery, fishermen in uh, Jersey, France, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, we, 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 we tend to forget that financial services is one of the main, uh, main, main sector for UK and for France. Also, it is important for us to, 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 make, uh, uh, to make a special focus on, uh, on financial services. And also because, uh, as you may know, uh, in the trade cooperation agreement, you know, we, we didn't see much about uh, what the future will look like, will, will look like between the UK and, and Europe on, uh, on financial services. So it was important for us to pause here and to be able to focus on what is at stake in, uh, in, in the financial services, uh, uh, services sector. And because for France and for UK, these are two main, two, two important sectors, because uh, it, it, as you can see, uh, France is important in Europe. We have uh, five banks out of 15. Uh, so we have uh, we have uh, we have an important asset manager, MND. You know, just uh, bought this morning. I don't see if, if you if you see in the newspapers, they just decided to bought this morning uh, another asset management, Lixo. So so you have Lixo plus MND. Uh, now you have an international champion in France. So this is an important sector, Franco, uh, uh, for, for, for France and for and for and for Great Britain. So so that's why it was important for us to make a special focus on these uh, services, on, on these financial services. The second main reason for me is also because we wanted with this report to focus also on what the future will look like. So not only focusing on the past, but also on the future. And, and, and you will see so, some focus on, uh, on, two, on two, um, two sectors. One is, uh, is, is finance durable, so sustainable finance. So, so, so it is important to see how we can build the future with our, our UK friends. And, and we definitely think that uh, uh, France and UK can have some leading conversation in Europe on these two, uh, two, two sectors. So, so, so sustainable finance, and also the other one is on fintech insurance and uh, uh, insure tech and digitalization. So we definitely think that with Quotient and Institute, we can leverage these two ambitions with France and UK to build the, the, future, uh, the future in Europe with these two leading uh, conversation on Quotient and Institute will help will help on that. So I will let the floor with my, uh, with my PwC colleague just uh, to, to make a special focus on this uh, dedicated report. So I will let them the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jimmy. 
Um, so we are very pleased to share with you this new analysis, uh, which focuses on financial services. Um, Mathilde, I will quickly present to you the key facts and figures we highlighted in, a, in the study, but the main focus today will be uh, with our key specialists to focus on three topics of interest. The first one will be Brexit, the second one will be fintechs, and the third one will be sustainable finance. So just a precision to begin with, uh, financial services covers the banking and capital market sectors, but also insurance, reinsurance, and asset management. So I will quickly go through the study, but of course you will be able to download it on the, on the website. The idea is not to go through everything in detail, just to give you the main highlight of the study. So um, first, uh, uh, as we presented in our last barometer, financial services represent more than 8 billion of euros traded between France and the UK in 2019. So financial services is the sector where the UK has the most important trade surplus with France. And this trade surplus is 3.5 billion of euros in 2019. So this is really a key sector for both of economy, as uh, Jimmy said just before. If we look quickly at the UK, Financial services is the main exporting sector for the UK with France, and the UK is the world's largest exporter of financial services. As you can see here in the above chart, um, the contribution of financial services to UK economy is around 6.9% or more than 150 billion of euros. So this is really, really massive. And above euros, it represents a significant part of the employment in the UK, with more than 1 million people in, employed in financial services in 2020. So this is really a key sector for the UK, but it, uh, it is also a key sector for France. Um, it, while it is smaller than in the UK, it is really active and strong. And as we said, uh, we can see here that France is the second in Europe after the UK in the insurance sector and in the asset manager sector, asset management sector, sorry. So, and if we see that the UK, it was around 7% the contribution of financial services to the economy. For French, it's around 4.6%, which is quite uh, significant also. And we have around 800,000 people that are employed in financial services in France in 2020. And we can see that this is mainly in the banking sector or in the insurance sector. As I've said, uh, firstly, um, in, in the introduction, we can see that um, financial services is a historical surplus sector for the UK with friends. However, what is interesting, and this is what you can see in this graph, is that the, the gap is gradually narrowing as the export from France to the UK, this is the blue you have here in this graph, is really, um, is uh, increased, have increased, uh, sorry, significantly over the last five years. This trend could be explained maybe by the desire of the British firms to set up set, uh, subsidiaries in France or in Europe. So we can see here that the gap is narrowing. We will see in the next years what it will be in terms of trends. Um, and maybe just to go quickly, a final word on the current crisis to wrap up this overview, quick overview of a fact and figure. Um, we can see that the, the financial services sector has more than resisted to the COVID crisis. Indeed, if we compare to sector heavily impacted, such as transportation, for instance, financial services experienced limited impacts. It was nothing compared to the 2008 crisis, but really two points of interest we wanted to highlight here. One, the crisis was a huge driver for the transformation of work in the financial services sector, with the generalization of e-working and acceleration of digitalization. And second point, the financial services were, hard, were in fact at the heart of mobilization against the crisis. The banks were granting loans, insurers made some extra contractual gesture, etc. So it was a, um, a huge contribution of financial services to help with the crisis. Um, just to give you a this overview of key facts and figures, but as I said, the idea here is really to focus on the outlooks and perspective of the financial services sector. So we have selected three topics of interest. The first one is Brexit, and I will therefore give the floor to Timothée Junia, who is a director at PwC as a specialist of Brexit questions. And Thank you very much, Mathilde. Um, I, I hope uh, everyone can hear me well. 
Um, so uh, as, as a quick introduction, I would say that uh, um, the, the content of, of this analysis on the impact of uh, Brexit on financial services can be summarized in, in one sentence. Uh, whatever happens in, in the near future, uh, the way financial services are exchanged between the EU and UK as Hello, can you hear yep. me? Yeah, we, we disappeared. Your, your vital sentence disappeared. <laughs> so you said the way okay. financial services, and that's when we lost you. <laughs> All right, so I, I, I'll go back to, uh, to the sentence. So whatever happens in, in the near future, the way financial services are exchanged between the EU and the UK uh, has been irrevocably changed. So, as you, as you know, since 1st of January 2021, UK financial services firms are no longer able to provide the, the services on a, on a cross-border basis in reliance on, on, on uh, EU passporting mechanisms. Um, in, in, in anticipation of this, most uh, larger firms uh, reorganized their operation in a manner that enabled them to continue to service uh, both their EU uh, and UK clients. Uh, nevertheless, uh, significant uh, efficiencies for, for clients and, and market participants may be gained by, by allowing a, a more open provision of services and trading to take place uh, on the basis of the equivalence. Uh, so equivalence means that uh, one country agrees that uh, another country's regulation are equivalent as its own. Uh, as a reminder, in the EU, this is done, uh, the, this granting of equivalence is done centrally by, by the EU Commission. Uh, as of now, the UK has granted 17 equivalences to the EU, um, and uh, uh, the EU has only granted two equivalents to the UK, and 28 uh, requests that are still pending approval. Um, as you all know also, so far there, there was little regarding financial services in, in the Brexit deal. And therefore, in an effort to simplify the process for granting new equivalents, the EU published a, a memorandum of understanding um, that, will, that is in the process of being signed between the EU and, and the UK, uh, that makes a, a number of provision, especially uh, a couple of ones uh, that are a, a new forum to be set up between uh, the EU and the UK, mainly to discuss uh, changes to regulation and, and to exchange on uh, equivalences. Uh, and second one is, is a reminder that equivalences are a separate decision that only relies on, on uh, uni unilateral rulings. Um, the MOU, so Memorandum of Understanding, is definitely uh, what we, we could call a stepping stone in the direction of equivalence, but no concrete proposal as to a specific equivalence determination will result from it. So there, there is no uh, granting of equivalence in that uh, uh, Memorandum of Understanding. Um, all of this uh, may be vain, it could be vain, um, as there is a, a, a growing impatience in the UK and, and uh, uh, what we could call a, a growing tendency to push for, for regulatory freedom from the EU and to concentrate on, on business with uh, other key partners such as uh, uh, the US and China. Indeed, uh, for the UK, accepting uh, to not diverge from EU rules uh, may be too much of a price to pay for equivalence uh, that can then be withdrawn by the EU Commission uh, at a, a very short notice, a 30-day uh, notice. So without those equivalents, what, what are the, 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 the best way to continue to, to exchange uh, financial services? Um, so th there is the, the, the opportunity to create subsidiary or, or branches uh, in the countries uh, or, or in the block. Um, these new entities uh, have their, their, their own legal identity in the US country. And this means that business will no longer be between the city of London and EU clients, but rather 
between EU-based subsidiary or branches and EU clients. However, this implies huge costs. Um, American banks who, who, who had previously relied on London uh, for, for the EU hub have kept their London subsidiary for, for the, the UK market, obviously, uh, but also created new subsidiary in the EU so that they can serve uh, their EU clients. For instance, JP Morgan Chase & Co. and uh, uh, Goldman Sachs have moved billions of, uh, of dollars in assets and thousands of staff from the UK to the continent. A happy, uh, I would say a happy note for France is that uh, it is a, a choice destination for, for some of these moves. Uh, Paris come, come second after Dublin as a, a, a destination for EU-based entity uh, that were previously uh, headquartered or based in, uh, in the UK. And Mr. Villeroy de Gallo, so governor of the uh, Bank de France, said in January that um, this year uh, that uh, 2,500 jobs and uh, roughly 170 billion euro in assets uh, have been moved from the UK uh, to France since the referendum. Uh, another point to note is that even though we, we, we talk about this less in, here in France, uh, the reverse is also true. So the FCA has revealed that since the referendum, 1,500 EU-based financial services firms have applied for a license to operate in the UK to serve UK clients uh, from the UK. And uh, among these, uh, approximately 100 retail uh, and, and wholesale banks and, and 400 uh, insurers and insurer intermediary firms um, have requested that, that license. So as you can see, things are, are, are moving quite fast. The, the UK is doing uh, 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 all it can to lure US firms to the UK. Um, this is uh, the way it found to, to make up for, for loss in share uh, of trading capital. Um, so uh, Bloomberg reported last week that uh, the quantity of share traded in the UK uh, was down 33% since December whereas it, it has risen 54% uh, in Paris. Uh, but at the same time, the UK is now able to, for instance, exchange Swiss shares on its market for, for the first time since uh, the EU ban, uh, which could allow the UK to catch up on the loss in volume of trading that it, uh, it suffered since, uh, since December. So, uh, as a conclusion, all of, all of this is, is very new uh, and, and we are still not uh, ready to measure the long-term impacts, uh, but we are delighted to, to see the publication of this paper uh, as an early uh, analysis of the changing world of Franco-British financial sector. Thank you very much, Tim. Um, and we will see what the next month will bring up with uh, this uh, future uh, relationship. Um, as you know, with the cross channel, we always wanted to look at Brexit, but also to think beyond Brexit. And we think that the next topic will be one of the key trends for financial services, and this is fintechs. So I will uh, hand over to Pauline Adoncalfo, who is a partner at PwC and a specialist of fintechs. Hello, everybody. I'm very glad to be with you uh, this morning. So maybe to start, I would start with the why. So why are we talking about fintech today? Um, FinTech reported a strong growth for the first semester of 2020 compared to the first semester of 2019. And remember, this was before the pandemic. And this is quite unusual when we look at uh, different sectors. Second reason why I think it's uh, important to talk about FinTech, 70%. 70% is the... Uh, total operating cost of a fintech um, uh, lower to uh, the traditional bank uh, with a, f a large physical network. So it's 70% it's less for fintech than uh, for a traditional bank. And maybe uh, last figure uh, about the investment. 
there has there has been 4.1 billion euro invested in fintech in the UK in 2020, and this is more than investment of the uh, which have been done in the four next European countries combined. And when we talk about France, which is one of those, uh, it's uh, less than a billion. It's 828 uh, million euros. Um, if we compare it to the US, just to have a to have an idea, we're talking about 17 billion euros. So it's huge investment, it's a growing industry, and it's a very profitable industry. So what are we talking exactly when we talk about fintech? Um, the word fintech it combines uh, the word finance and uh, technology. And it refers to innovation startups that use technology to uh, revamp, to reinvent uh, the financial, the banking, and the insurance industries, which is why it's fintech, it's quite generic word. And so, and so for, it's generic, but then you have some uh, intratech in the uh, insurance uh, industry. You have some rec tech, uh, which are um, uh, around regulatory. Those fintechs, they have strongly, strongly com uh, combined to the transformation by bringing first B2C uh, business to consumer solutions uh, to clients and uh, by being digitalized, digitalization levers for traditional financial services uh, stakeholders. So they have, let's say, three main uh, type of competing um, um, positioning. The first one is that they uh, compete uh, with traditional financial institution and as such, they have uh, to obtain licenses from relevant authorities. Um, and this has been the first positioning of the uh, FinTech. They came onto, in, the, in the financial industry because they wanted to disrupt. They considered that it was old fashioned, they could bring new experiences and uh, they could be uh, challengers. And PwC, we do everywhere, every year, a CEO survey where we um, ask uh, the CEOs uh, um, of their expectations or the, of the uh, worries that they have. And until two years ago, uh, they were very afraid, the CEO uh, of the financial services, that new competitors, FinTech, would come and take some market shares. For two years, this number uh, of CEO that are worried about the FinTech has decreased. Why? Because they are, there is a switch. And now most of the FinTechs and the newcoming FinTechs support traditional financial institutions in distributing innovative products and services to niche markets that they cannot address or by operating on part of the traditional financial institution value chain or the whole value chains. So they are becoming more and more B2B uh, positioned and helping uh, the financial services to operate in a good way. Um, so just to give an example of a niche strategy, I want to mention Canto, uh, which is I think a very good example. It's a French neo bank and it offers payment services, financial management tools for small and medium businesses, as well as independent stakeholders, uh, which are uh, a population that has been highly impacted by the current pandemic, and therefore uh, has uh, an increased need of uh, flexibility. So what did the pandemic change? There is first a merging pledge uh, from customers for more trust, more transparency, and Mathilde in the, uh, in the introduction uh, started uh, by saying how financial servicing was as, at the center of the, uh, of the system uh, during the pandemic. Um, and the fintech, they offer this transparency uh, to, the, to the customers. They need simplification. They want to understand the product that they have. They want to understand if they are covered, yes or no, by the insurer, for example. They want to understand if they can have the loan, yes or no. Simplification is also something that is brought by the FinTech. Third thing, um, it's digitalization of processes. 
um, with the uh, crisis, sanitary crisis, uh, lots of physical uh, agencies have been closed uh, and having uh, all these solutions to operate in a digital way uh, was the solution. Thus, we can say that FinTech, they can showcase numerous assets, such as bringing a smooth client experience with an ergonomic interface, simplified processes, and greater access day-to-day -day operations. So they really bring to uh, uh, the new, um, to, to, for, for the people, the new uses of financial services and they, they meet uh, the client's expectations, being the client's uh, cust final customers or business customers. So how? We talked about the why, the what, and now the how. So how do they operate with uh, the uh, traditional sector? Um, in this context, and with these new players emerging on, the, on their market, the banks that Mathilde was mentioning, the asset managers, the insurers, they are pursuing alliances that can take different shape depending on the goal they're trying to reach. Four, four main types. First one is acquisition, uh, equity investment, and I come back to uh, my introduction with the high amount that has been invested in fintech. Um, so it can be acquisition to uh, own new technology, target new markets, as I mentioned, or just decrease uh, the cost. Second, creation, in-house solutions uh, that, are, uh, that are built within the traditional uh, stakeholders. It can be to uh, support in-house innovation. It can be to offer uh, target offers or to develop new technologies capabilities. Third one, very simple. It's only partnership, collaborations um, to integrate those uh, new solutions and to leverage the fintech know-how. Fourth one, incubation to foster uh, the development, innovation, and new technologies to bring the financial and administration support or to leverage the agility. Um, and guess what? Uh, the main uh, traditional uh, stakeholders, they do a combination of those uh, four uh, types of uh, collaborations. So um, just to conclude, with the pandemic, uh, with all the acceleration of uh, digital, uh, digital services, all the uh, urge for trust, transparency coming from the customers, we uh, are convinced that the sector will be more and more booming. Thank you very much, Pauline. Another key outlook for the financial sector that we, we need to look at uh, for the next uh, years. Um, the last issue, finally, we wanted to focus on is an emerging trend that will be, if not already is, inevitable in the next year to come. This is sustainable finance. And I will hand over to Nicolas Bourdier, who is a partner at PwC and a specialist of sustainable finance issues. Thanks, Mathilde. Thanks a lot. And thank you very much, everyone, for having me today I'm talking about sustainable finance. So to your point, Mathilde, um, ESG is definitely the new trendy, I would say, acronym in 2021. So we have seen um, a dramatic acceleration of interest in ESG in the past 12 to, let's say, 18 months. And at PwC, where we actually created our own sustainability team 27 years ago, we observe an important increased awareness of the impact of companies on the environment and society and particularly in the financial services industry. So driven by factors such as climate change, social inequality, and of course the impact of this COVID-19 situation, ESG has become front of mind for all and actually everybody. And it's, it has even been amplified um, through social media platform over the, the, I would say the last two to three years. Uh, so to Jimmy's point earlier at the beginning of the session, so UK and France are really at the forefront of this topic. Our two countries are leading with, I would say, our German colleague, the most important part of the conversation that used to be uh, mainly around risk and regulatory topics, especially in Europe. In fact, in Europe, we do have a specific regulatory landscape. Um, that to be to be fully transparent has been initially perceived by some financial institution as an important burden, um, especially when compared to the US that were until recently almost nowhere on the matter. 
Uh, but things uh, start to change thanks to the new US presidency. And the US are actually catching up in response to the, the, the Europe situation, but with a much more business oriented approach. In practice, uh, what the US want to do or what they want to avoid is um, actually to, um, to be governed uh, or to, to fall under uh, the European rules. Uh, that are much more focused on, um, I would say, pre preserving the, the environment and, uh, and I would say, smoothing the impact of our uh, various activities onto the, 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 govern the, um, sorry, the environment and the society. Um, the, the way the U.S. are looking at the situation is pretty different. They are much more about conducting businesses um, effect efficient businesses and proactive businesses. And so they are trying just to, in response to what the, uh, the European regulation already uh, released, uh, they are trying to, um, I would say, uh, refocus the attention on uh, conducting sustainable business, but without all the burden of um, measuring the impact of their own businesses into the environment and the society. So it's much more on how they will be impacted and disrupted by the environment rather than how they will, um, they, they, they will impact themselves the, um, the environment going forward. So in a nutshell, um, the things start to change and we, we are observing a sort of consolidation at some point of the, uh, the, the various um, initiative globally, Asia start to, to catch up uh, too. Um, and the world industry is being transformed. And the risk and regular topics that were at the top of the iceberg initially are now um, decreasing in terms of interest. Uh, they are for sure still important and a lot of financial institutions are still investing a lot of money in, uh, in compliance and uh, I would say um, um, a regulatory driven initiative. But um, to Larry Fling point, so the CEO of BlackRock um, stated, I would say it was maybe 18 months ago, that at a certain point, there would be a sort of a sustainability license to operate, which would prevent the laggards to operate on the market. So financial um, institutions are now investing in this area. So meaning that after, uh, after having established their own strategy and their own pathway to become more sustainable, they now focus on reviewing their product, services, solution to properly and consistently align their operation and um, business activities with their um, internal strategy and the external commitments they made to the market and the society. So after having invested a lot of money in just compliance and I would say disclosure and reporting activities, they are now trying to review the way they are operating and the way they are conducting business on the market in order to become more sustainable, to at least be perceived as more sustainable and more responsible toward the society and environment. And, and so in that context, success is no longer about just you know, financial or disclosure or climate change or diversity alone. It's how um, all these principles will be embedded together in a consistent way and how the business operation uh, will be embedded into the firm strategy consistently and how the operation will be conducted uh, with respect, uh, with, um, um, uh, I would say, with a, a better emphasis on the impact they will be having on both the market and their own ecosystem. So it's coming fast. Um, it's, uh, it's coming soon and I'm conscious of the time. Uh, so, and over to you, uh, Mathilde, if you, uh, if you want to, yeah. Take care on that point. Yeah, thank you very much, Nicolas. And as you said, we are running a bit late, so I will just conclude in a few words. Uh, as we saw, financial services are really key to both our economy. Um, I'm really looking forward to pursue our discussion uh, with Sylvie and Miles, and I encourage each of you to download our detailed study on the Cross Channel Institute website, where you will find uh, more detail on all the topics we just covered today. And thank you very much to all. Uh, our speaker today, and uh, I hand over to you, uh, James. Mathilde, uh, thanks a lot. Yeah, um, so as we press on, I think what's really interesting about your report is that we started off in a, uh, in a how can I say, in a minor, a micro, minor sense of France, UK. And in fact, as you've gone through your discussion points, we've ended up much more in a global 
um, in a global scenario, which uh, which is pretty much borderless and, and 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 frontierless, if that's the right way of saying it. So um, so Miles and Sylvie, starting with Sylvie as um, as uh, ladies first, as we still continue, we're still allowed to say that. I think um, would be really great to know what your um, what your sort of take and what your first reactions are on this study. Well, <clears throat> thank you all of you. Thank you to the whole team of uh, PwC for this very interesting presentation. I'm glad to be with you today. Uh, well, I will draw the same conclusion as you did, James. And and when we prepared, you remember that. Uh, I was trying to insist on the global dimension. I really believe that we have, we have spent many years discussing uh, of us uh, being very inward looking in Europe, I would say in general uh, across the channel and, and the world meanwhile is changing a lot. So thank you for tackling these very important issues of uh, climate uh, transition to net zero, uh, digitalization of the economy, uh, you mentioned also briefly the fact that um, inequalities are, are becoming also an issue uh, at, at the global level. So I really believe that we should stop just talking about the relationship, but look forward and, and, and beyond. What I can say from my current position is that we have an, ex an excellent cooperation with Bank of England on, on climate issues. Of course, it was... And, <laughs> James, it's so good yet that you believe that I'm at the Bank of England. No, it's just a joke, but I think we, we are really working in another way. And there is a network of uh, central banks, uh, including now more than 90 uh, central banks um, uh, dealing with climate issues. It was uh, created a little bit more than three years ago. And uh, France and the Bank of England, the Bank de France are, are among uh, the, the, the funders. And... It's a very interesting way of um, dealing with a highly political issue only at a technical level, but providing the tools for the ones who would like to uh, enter. And, and as uh, Nicolas said, when you discuss with the, the, the Americans, they are the last ones who joined us. It's very interesting because I think they are very much, they, they are business oriented. They want to look at it not only from a regulation or framework perspective or supervision, but uh, it's how can we make money out of, of this um, transition and make sure it is profitable. So this is a very important field for, for cooperation. Um, you tackled also the, the the fintech big tech issue, which is a which is a complicated one because there are uh, there is a huge potential. Sometimes we are concerned in central banks that we don't destroy uh, the, the the financial stability. I mean, innovation is good; it's positive. We we want to promote uh, to promote it. But making sure that, for example, all the rules we have put in place uh, to fight against money laundering or financing of terrorism uh, are not uh, circumvented by, by new actors. Uh, also, the fact that we can make sure that they offer a proper, uh, that they can offer uh, cheap uh, services, but also safe ones, and that one day we don't have uh, troubles with uh, some some consumers who would uh, trust um, uh, companies that are not uh, reliable. So this is this is an important concern, not for us, not because we would like to defend the powers of uh, of, of central banks and and public authorities, but at the end, to make sure that finance is really. Um, um, bringing uh, an answer to, to, to the demand of, of ordinary uh, citizens, people who want to send money uh, because they are migrants, uh, they want to send money abroad, et cetera, et cetera. So these are, of course, the two main issues. Maybe one word on something that is dear to my heart. Uh, it's the fact that we are observing changes in the functioning of the markets because of the pandemics. Uh, and, and nobody would deny that uh, the intervention of states and, and central banks was necessary in order to avoid a catastrophe. But what is going to happen next? And this is also a field where it would be interesting to discuss uh, across the channel. Um, 
we, we need to keep the markets functioning. Uh, we have to make them more efficient. Uh, as far as climate change is concerned, for example, uh, Lord Stern wrote already 15 years ago that markets are not pricing properly uh, the risks. And of course, it's not just a duty for uh, financial regulators and central banks. The, the carbon pricing is mainly the responsibility of uh, elected governments. Uh, there are discussions at the G7 level. I was yesterday in, in the discussion of the ministers. Today we have the G20. Things are moving and they are moving in the right direction, but we are by far not where we should be. And as the market is not pricing properly uh, the, the cost deriving from uh, emission, carbon emission or destruction of biodiversity and, and natural capital, uh, this is also an important point to extend the question to biodiversity. Uh, then we have um, a tendency to compensate through uh, measures taken at the prudential, prudential level or uh, through the risks, which is, which is good for the planet. And I personally don't have any, um, how can I say, it's, it's, it's so vital, it's so urgent that each of us should try to do something. But of course, you cannot compensate the lack of action from the public authorities on some, on some, um, on some issues. It is also a matter for democracies. In democracies, elected government have the primary responsibility of dealing with such an issue. So we do our best, we will continue. But how do you conceive the, the combination of policies decided by elected governments and measures taken by supervisors or by the financial sector as such? Uh, this is a, a really important issue. We observe that in the last 20 years for corruption, for anti-money laundering, for financial stability, um, the states are always asking more to private companies uh, and it's normal that they provide some, some, some information on that. But how far should we go? This is a very philosophical question. So I stop here because I'm going too far. One point that was not mentioned and which is important in my opinion in the post-Brexit world, it's the question of data and personal data and how can we make sure that uh, in the respect of the, the choices made by, by France and the UK, we managed to find a common ground in which we allow business to function uh, smoothly and quite all businesses are needing uh, data, I need of, of data right now. Um, my very last point is that of course we should look forward and not uh, spend our time to, to, to discuss uh, Brexit or whatever, it's not our job, we have governments for that. Just one remark, we made different choices in globalization. And I think we should not underestimate what it means. Uh, the UK decided to leave. Uh, France is member of the European Union and of the Euro area. And if we look forward, uh, I'm, maybe I'm wrong, nobody knows what is going to happen, but the sustainability of the European Union and the Euro requires new step toward a more political union. It's obvious. Uh, maybe it will happen, maybe it will not happen. And nobody knows what is going to, what the consequences are going to be. But we should not underestimate the fact that the starting point now is a very different one from a shared market to shared economy. Maybe we will miss very much the British input for the market and for uh, open trade and, and, and uh, the functioning of, uh, of the European market, but it's not um, up to me to decide. So we have to be very, how can I say, very candid and clear on what is no more uh, the, the, the common framework and try to, to build another one. There are enough topics on which we can uh, cooperate. So thank you very much for your very interesting um, study and I'm, I'm open to all questions, of course. Thank you. Sylvie, thanks a lot. I think it's really interesting. Miles, I'll hand over to you. I think what's, what, one thing that's really interesting you mentioned and, and it was, the, was that the, I know of one pretty significant French group, for example, that um, announced in February that they had added um, uh, um, ESG criteria to their covenants for their credit lines. Um, and that was pushed by them, not by the uh, not by the lending banks, 
Um, and, you know, maybe in the future, that would be uh, something one would expect as a shareholder of a listed company that that their bank covenants would include ESG criteria. But, but Miles, uh, uh, what's your take on, and Sylvie's added lots of new things as well. <laughs> Sylvie has. So thank you, James, for the uh, opportunity to, uh, to speak at this event. And thank you to Sylvie, who I think has provided a fantastic tour of the horizon uh, of the issues that we're looking at today. Uh, and my compliments to the PWC team for what I think is a really important uh, contribution to this discussion uh, and I think one of the things that that underlines uh, is the depth uh, uh, and the breadth of the economic relationship between the UK and France especially uh, in financial and related professional services and that that is based not just uh, on the areas that people are very familiar with uh, if you like the, 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 the older areas uh, of economic collaboration and cooperation uh, but as we look to the future uh, and as we look to the areas uh, and the issues that industry uh, and customers and governments and regulators are going to be dealing with uh, and grappling in the in the years ahead. And I think one of the interesting things is sort of Sylvie set out where the debate has been and where the discussion has been between central bankers, between regulators. And we see this very much on the uh, on the commercial side, on the uh, uh, between businesses. So the City UK, which is the representative body for UK based financial and related professional services companies, works with uh, organisations such as the City of London Corporation, which is in essence uh, the local government for the square mile. And we have a series of dialogues that we uh, undertake with our European counterparts in industry. And there is a very uh, a very active, uh, very constructive uh, Anglo-French financial services dialogue. Uh, and that deals with a huge number uh, of the areas that we've already talked about here, because when you look at Brexit, when you look at COVID, when you look at some of the political changes that we've seen over the last five or 10 years, um, these have been accelerators of pre-existing uh, strategic trends. So you look at the uh, the role of data, you know, that comes up uh, extremely often in these conversations that we have with our counterparts in French industry. Sustainability, uh, uh, the role of fintech. Um, and the interesting thing in all of this as well is particularly when you look at, at, at sustainability in particular, you know, this is not something that is being done to industry by regulators or by governments. You know, there is clearly expectations that democratically elected politicians are expressing on behalf of their constituents. But we hear this from customers and we also hear this from staff. So the expectation of people within companies uh, that the company they work for will act, for lack of a better term, as a force for good, that it takes ESG issues seriously, that it makes a positive contribution to the world around it, is increasing. And that's also something we see very strongly when you think about um, attracting people into this industry. So it's not this is not the situation we were in 10 or 15 years ago where the industry had its uh, our industry had its its pick of people who were coming out of the the best universities and the best schools you know, those people increasingly uh, are looking towards tech firms uh, they're looking towards being entrepreneurs uh, so there is an expectation when they do join a company that that company will be progressive in terms of what it is doing on ESG issues so I think that all speaks to the expectations uh, that we're seeing, as I say, not just from regulators and politicians, not just from customers, but from within companies as well. And I think that's going to be a terrific dynamo for change uh, and innovation uh, in the years ahead. Um, and uh, one of the things that Sylvie touched on uh, that I think has or will act uh, 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 as a sort of an opening of the, of, the, of the floodgates on this as well will be the change in the way that the U.S., uh, uh, is operating now. So obviously under the previous administration, there was a different approach taken on ESG and sustainability issues. The Biden administration clearly much more focused on this. But even before the Biden administration came in, when we were talking to our counterparts in the American industry, uh, even a year ago, 18 months ago, the expectation of movement on sustainability uh, uh, and ESG issues was enormous. And I think that then touches on the cooperation uh, and the common interests and the shared agenda between the British industry and the French industry, uh, where there's been a lot of thinking on both sides uh, on this, a lot of thinking that's happened jointly 
uh, in these issues. And you can see this in the alignment between the British industry and the French industry and organizations such as the World Alliance of International Financial Centers, which we're both uh, members of, where that agenda about supporting <laughs> the environment, supporting the global recovery from COVID, stressing the role of this industry as a, uh, a, a force for good, a, a positive uh, to uh, social and economic outcomes and a positive yeah. contributor to a lot of the public policy challenges that we face over the next 10 or 20 years, I think particularly comes to the fore. So I think what the PwC report has done is just brought that to life, uh, emphasized that yes, there will be areas where the UK and France will be competitors, uh, but there is, a, there is a, a really important shared agenda uh, where we will cooperate, uh, particularly in international forums, uh, to ensure that some of these social uh, and public goods are taken forward in the years ahead. Thanks, Miles. Um, there are a few questions uh, coming in. Um, to add a new subject, um, Michel de Fabiani um, had an interesting question on, uh, on clearly a, an area where he's made a major investment himself. <laughs> Hi, Michel. Well, I, I was just uh, wondering about what I would call the parallel new uh, financial world, which is uh, the bitcoins or other similar monies. And do you think uh, France and UK have a joint position, a joint view on this subject? Maybe very briefly, uh, we discussed the topic, of course, in several uh, bodies and not in a bilateral framework, but it's clear that we consider them crypto assets and the G20 two years ago already uh, decided that we have to make sure that it does not bring at the point I have mentioned before, which is that you have people who uh, invest believing it's safe and that at least people know what they are doing. So I know that uh, in France, we do a lot of uh, publicity. It's not the competence of the Banque de France, it's more the IMF as it is a product uh, on, on the market. But I don't see um, a real diversion on this in the uh, risk assessment above all. I just briefly add that that's very much the case from a commercial perspective in terms of the approach that we see from both the, the British and the French industries as ever there is a, a balance here between what is an asset and you know what is effectively an electronic currency clearly going to be really important as we move forward uh, uh, in terms of the way that the industry adapts and evolves uh, and the economy adapts and evolves so what we're in favour of is is the right regulatory framework that is proportionate in terms of how this is taken forward. Thank you. Okay, Olivier, Olivier Campagnon, I think, Olivier, your question is probably for Mathilde, because it's, uh, is, there, is there a winner um, of people moving their operations from, uh, from uh, one country to another? It, 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 indeed, James. I mean, th clearly we've been, we've been watching since the vote of Brexit, we've been watching this, this uh, point all across, you know, month after month, and, and the discussions on financial services were, where would that go, and which which capital, which European capital would actually get it, part or, or all, and um, and I, I, you know, my point is not to get back on polemics, but but it's more to understand if um, things have happened as as predicted, or or if actually, based on all of this study, we realize that no, it's it's being spread, but. But London is still London, as you would expect. And, um, and, and actually the financial services at all is probably even more impacted by the COVID and digitalization than anything else. Uh, yes, uh, I, I can take the point and maybe if, you, if someone from PwC team wants to complete. Uh, I'm not sure we can speak about winners or, or losers in, in, uh, in this area. Um, in fact, this is sure that Paris uh, gained some so, so some wins, I would say, uh, uh, some share uh, of, of the, the companies that uh, were attracted to Paris. Uh, there are many movements to Paris. I won't say that Paris is a clear winner. Uh, many of the European cap um, capitals uh, were, uh, um, had the movements such as Dublin, such uh, in uh, Frankfurt, also in uh, Germany. Um, 
I'm not sure it was exactly as predicted before the Brexit, or we said that every all the UK uh, firms will uh, come, or the foreign firm will come to Europe or come to Paris. Um, this is still a bit less than expected, maybe, uh, but uh, there are clear movements, and this clear movement is uh, you have the um, European Bank Ag Banking Agency in France um, now, you have some movement to France, but maybe the movement were there, but not in the volume that were expected, I would say. I, I'm not, I don't know if you, someone wants to complete, but I think this is the, the position. There were the movement, but not the, in the huge importance that were expected before the Brexit, because we didn't know what was uh, expected. Yes, if, if I just can add one more point, just in fact, if you hear from Germany, they say there's a clear winner. If you hear from France, they say there's a clear winner. If you hear from Germany, they say there's a clear winner. <laughs> You see, we know they will well, you know, that's quite... Uh, quite if, I may, if I may add one word, first of all, the reason why I insisted in my presentation that we made different choices is that, and it's for the whole exercise we are doing today, it's very interesting to look at France and UK, but France is part of the single market, France is part of the euro area, the supervision is made at the European level, rules are European, so I really believe that to a certain extent it's wrong to look at one country of the euro area, European Union, compared with, with the UK. This is the first point. The second point is that with COVID, nobody will ever know what Brexit would have been without. So it's, it's completely irrelevant to spend hours to decide. Nobody will know if people have left London because they were they were simply not uh, standing the, the measures anymore, etc. And my third point is maybe the, the most important one. I, I really believe that there was something and there is still something in London that is unique, which is a mix of competences where you don't have only banks and asset managers, but you have the lawyers, you have also the press, the specialized. So, and this is something that is uh, unique and, and we remain so. From a financial stability view um, as a central banker, maybe a more decentralized way of doing things is safer because the concentration brings huge advantages. Once again, it's a, it's a, in French we would say un biotope, it's, it's, a, it's an ecosystem. But of course, the fact that you concentrate uh, the, the compensation or you put all your eggs in the same basket to put it in a very uh, ordinary way may create some risk. So we don't know what it can be, a decentralized uh, financial system for, for the euro area. But in any case, the euro is something unique. Uh, nobody has a currency without a state. So we can also uh, innovate uh, from this point of view. But personally, I'm not very interested in, you know, the, the small race and Paris against Frankfurt. It would be absolutely ridiculous. Uh, if I could just very briefly add that I'd, I'd agree uh, almost entirely with what's been said so far by colleagues at PwC and by Sylvie. Um, I, I would also look outside Europe because one of the biggest winners of, of uh, what's happened here is actually outside Europe. It's New York. Thank you. It's very clear. Um, I think we, we've arrived at 9.30 and as I know much as everybody would like to keep on going. It's really interesting. Uh, Thierry, I don't know whether you would like, you had a, you had a question and, um, and uh, maybe Sylvie and, and Miles could answer your question. And then... yeah, I, I can make it very quick, uh, James. Uh, I get that we're talking about competencies and Sylvie just mentioned it. We're talking about talent. And, you know, with this uh, crisis, uh, we are in a unique situation. So uh, I'm thinking about uh, young, talented people. So what would be the main advice you would give to young people willing to join the financial services market, uh, you know, preparing the future? Uh, shall, I, uh, shall I kick off? Um, yeah. So uh, I think this is the critical question. When we ask our members and our companies, what's the single most important factor for your long-term success and the long-term success of the ecosystem uh, that our industry represents? You know, I used to think they'd say regulation, you know, and it's not. The single most important factor for them is talent and it's attracting people into this industry. And what I'd say to somebody thinking about joining this industry is 
forget about what you you might think about this industry forget about what you may have thought when you uh, saw the global financial crisis or you see films such as wolf of wall street if you really want to make a substantial difference uh, to the major public policy challenges that the world is facing, that the UK is facing, that France is facing, when you think about an aging population, the need for economic renewal, the need for infrastructure uh, 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 investment, uh, the need to prepare uh, for um, uh, the various changes that we're seeing as a result of sustainability. This is a, an, and the climate crisis. This is an industry that makes a difference. This is the industry where you can make a difference, where there is a clear purpose uh, and where you can make the biggest possible uh, contribution to tackling those changes. That's what I'd say. I personally would recommend uh, these young people to read Mark Carney's last book, Values, where he is, as Miles said, is 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 showing, is demonstrating that you can have a purpose when you are active in finance, that it's more on values with S than on just uh, fair value for the shareholders. And this is really one of the, 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 the dramatic changes with 10 years ago. I think we have drawn some lessons from the financial crisis. And in any case, the increased gravity of climate change will force us to have a purpose. Wherever you like it or not, it, it is at the agenda and it will stay and finance is part of the solution. So I really agree with Miles. It's about purpose. Uh, it's, as you said before, to be a force for good. It can sound a little bit uh, idealistic, but I'm quite sure at least to contribute to it. Thanks, Thank Sophie. you. Thierry, I'm conscious of time. So uh, Catherine, uh, Catherine says I, it's, 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 your, it's your moment to conclude. <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, uh, James. So uh, yes, I'm going to make it very short. Uh, first, uh, it is the opportunity for me uh, to really thank uh, you know, the Cross Channel Institute team, uh, the, the PwC Dream team, making a, a huge, a huge impact. And for sure, uh, you know, thanking uh, Sylvie, uh, Miles, and Jim. Thanks for sharing your experience. Thanks for sharing your expertise and for having this uh, discussion on a very uh, important and interesting topic. Um, just to conclude, I'd like to cover a uh, you know, very uh, limited point. First, the first uh, word I would use today is optimism. Why? I'm a, an optimistic guy and we can be optimistic about the future. Um, I think that we are after a unique period. We are at the end of the tunnel for many reasons. I'm not going into the details, but from an economic point of view, uh, and it was, as it was reminded uh, earlier, fundamentals of the economy, the overall economy are very healthy. I would say that so many, uh, you know, money was injected into the overall system. And at the end of the day, it will produce positive impact. Uh, interesting to look at the early numbers from a GDP, from a worldwide basis, and especially the one coming from the US with a plus 7% expected growth for the future. And we know that the US impact, you know, is creating kind of momentum over uh, the uh, entire uh, economy. Uh, as it was uh, clearly mentioned by Pauline, the FinTech analysis was extremely interesting because I really believe that our future is all going to be about innovation, is all going to be about digitalization, is all going to be about simplification. And probably uh, you know, one of the lessons learned coming from the past period uh, we came uh, through was about acceleration of transformation, digitalization, and uh, the positive impact coming from uh, technology. Uh, was mentioning global. Yeah, I think it's a mix between global and local. And I really believe that our economy is more and more global. And this is something that we have to take into account. Uh, and to, to finish it's a short conclusion, uh, I was thinking about, you know, getting out uh, of this situation and listening to what has been said by Sylvie, uh, by, the, by the PwC team and, and Miles. I think we are, uh, you know, uh, we can take the best from this situation in terms of economic relationship between the two countries. And it, it's, it's a triple opportunity. First, this is and it was, as it was clearly mentioned, this is the opportunity to reinvent the relationship and the partnership 
between the UK and France moving forward. And there is so much areas where uh, we have to partner and we will continue to partner. A second opportunity is it's a competitive world and healthy competition is good. So it's an opportunity for France probably to, uh, uh, to enforce its attractiveness. And the third opportunity, and I think that clearly, uh, Sylvie, you mentioned it, uh, it's really the opportunity to strengthen uh, Europe and to define what's going to be the vision for the next 20, 25 years. And this is all about the European project. And uh, we have to get out of this situation with this vision uh, for the next uh, 25 years. Uh, and, and probably my last uh, word uh, would be about uh, thinking about people. Because we all know uh, whether you're uh, uh, in the finance industry, uh, in the finance services, in any kind of uh, uh, economic engine, it's all about people. And probably the good point getting out of this period is all about talent, is all about uh, people. And I would like just to, to finish with uh, one sentence that I love to share. Uh, if you deeply take care of people, they will take care of the business. And, and I really believe that uh, this is something which is just, just absolutely crucial. So having said that, I want to, to thank all of you for uh, you know, attending this session. James, many thanks, you were bright. Sylvie and Miles, thank you for sharing your, exper your um, expertise. And uh, a special thanks to uh, the young and talented PwC team, Françoise, uh, you are a fantastic uh, general of army. Thank you for that. And uh, I wish you a lovely day. Okay, take care. Bye-bye. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you. Bye. Bye. Have a great day. Thank you.